Good evening. I think we're going to get going. Um, welcome to tonight's event. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to uh, the event tonight sponsored by the Center for Global Initiatives at Manhoya College. I'm Eva Paus, the director of the center. The center was founded earlier in the year to unite Mount Holyoke's wealth of international programs and people and to implement a coherent vision for education for global citizenship. A necessary condition for global citizenship is an understanding of critical international issues from cross-cultural and cross-national perspectives. One way through which we hope to foster such understanding is by hosting Global Studies Fellows in residence who will engage the community in dialogue on important issues in a variety of settings, where the lectures like tonight, where the classes, informal gatherings, etc. It is my great honor and pleasure to welcome Rami Khoury as our first Global Studies Fellow. At a time when the continuing fighting in Iraq and the long-standing Palestinian-Israeli conflict are a growing threat to stability and peace in the Middle East and beyond. When widespread international disagreement with the U.S. invasion of Iraq has led to a growing isolation of the United States in the international arena. And when relations between the United States and the Arab world are strained, it is particularly important to hear an assessment of these issues from an insightful voice from that part of the world. That insightful voice comes from Rami Khoury, the executive editor of the Daily Star in Beirut, which is published throughout the Middle East in conjunction with the International Herald Tribune. A Palestinian Jordanian whose family resides in Beirut, Nazareth. Curry is an internationally syndicated political columnist and book author whose commentaries many of you will have heard on NPR or read in the Washington Post. Mr. Curry holds a degree in political science and communication from Syracuse University. He was a Neiman Journalism Fellow at Harvard in 2001-2002 and he was appointed a member of the Brookings Institution Task Force on U.S. relations with the Islamic world. He will talk to us tonight about Iraq and the wider American dilemma in the Middle East. Without any further ado, please welcome our Global Studies Fellow, Rami Khoury. Thank you very much, uh, Eva. I'm uh, honored and delighted to, uh, to be here um, at Mount Holyoke College uh, as the first uh, global uh, fellow uh, at the Institute. And uh, uh, I thank you all very much for coming out here tonight to uh, hear my thoughts on the issues that I want to talk to you about. Um, discussing the Middle East uh, in the United States from an Arab perspective is, uh, is always a, uh, a tricky and very sensitive thing to do, but the more difficult thing for me to do tonight is to admit to you that I'm a lifelong New York Yankees fan. Uh, <laughs> and in the spirit of humiliation, humility and re reconciliation, I congratulate the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> and, and I just want you to know that we let you win once a century, so it'll be a while more. But wait till next year. Um, but they, that Ava told me that they would guarantee my physical security if I came here and, and admitted that I was a New York Yankees fan. Um, but the, uh, the issues uh, in the Middle East uh, are a little bit more serious, uh, though obviously also often raise the same kind of passions. Uh, and what I'd like to do is uh, to go over what I believe are the important issues uh, in the Middle East and 
between the Middle East and the United States, particularly between the Arab countries and the United States. And to present to you a perspective uh, from the Arab world, my personal perspective, but I think a perspective also that is shared by many, perhaps most people uh, in the Arab world, and perhaps wider than just the Arab world uh, as well. And some of the things that I'll tell you, you may not be very comfortable with, you may not agree with, uh, but I just hope that uh, you will accept them, first of all, uh, in the spirit of uh, candor and, and honesty that, uh, in which they're presented, and second of all, that you would think about these issues uh, so that we can perhaps find the uh, way out of the current cycle of tension and violence and warfare and beheadings and kidnappings um, that defines the predominant relationship between the, uh, the Middle East or the Arab countries uh, and the United States. Um, Iraq is the, or is the main focus right now of, of American concern in the, in the Middle East and the Arab world because of the presence of the American forces there and the active fighting that's still going on and the uh, concerns that people have about where this policy is, uh, is going to lead and what will be its implications. Uh, but I think we need to have a wider perspective to look around the region to see the full range of issues that define both the Middle East itself but also the uh, dynamic between the Middle East and the United States. And we're talking now just over three years after 9-11 uh, and the events uh, of that terrible day and we can see now some trends are starting to emerge, uh, some trends that uh, are clear and some other trends that are not so clear. Uh, and uh, I'll go over uh, some of these and, and give you my thoughts on them, and, uh, and then we can have an open question and answer period uh, at the end as well. Um, but I think that one of the things that we can identify right now in the Middle East uh, and the American relationship to it is the possibility of uh, factors converging to signal um, a possibility of change, of change within the Middle East and of change in American uh, interaction with the Middle East. The re-election of uh, President Bush and the new, uh, the second term uh, that he's, uh, he's just going to start on soon. The January elections scheduled in uh, Iraq for a uh, Iraqi assembly uh, that will lead to a permanent uh, constitution. Uh, the passing away of Yasser Arafat, the emergence of a new leadership uh, and also hopefully uh, parliamentary elections in Palestine uh, in the next uh, two or three months or so. Uh, a new uh, round of, uh, of uh, United States and European diplomatic engagement with both Syria and Iran. Uh, this diplomatic engagement is positive and negative both at the same time and includes threats and sanctions, uh, threats of sanctions, and it also includes inducements, uh, especially with the European involvement with Iran uh, and also with, uh, with Syria. And the last factor that is uh, portent for change possibly is the movement that we've had recently in the last six months about um, a, an engagement between the G8, the, the world's leading industrial powers, with the countries of the Arab world to look at the process of economic and political reform. Uh, for better governance, for free market economies, for uh, reforms across the board. All of those factors together, uh, I think, suggest that we are on the verge, on the threshold of a new era of significant, potentially significant change. Whether that change is for the better or for the worse is going to depend largely on the decisions that are made uh, in the coming year, or maybe even before, uh, by leadership uh, the leadership in this country by the leadership uh, in Israel and by the leadership uh, in the Arab countries as well. Um, one of the problems we've had in recent years, I would suggest, is mediocre leadership um, insofar as the Middle East is concerned. Uh, and across the board, uh, the Arabs, the Israelis, and the United States uh, in recent years, I think, have had rather mediocre um, leaderships in terms of addressing the real issues uh, that uh, define them. And one of, the reason, one of the consequences of that is the present situation that, that we're in. 
If we take a look at the broader Middle East environment, uh, what do we see? Uh, we see a paradox um, of, uh, of rapid and significant change in many aspects of life in the Middle East, uh, a Middle East in, in flux, and at the same time, we see a Middle East, or at least the Arab world, let me say, that I know best, that is fundamentally still addressing the same issues that were faced by certainly my grandparents 70 and 80 years ago. Um, the same issues that confronted the people in the Arab world around 1910, 1920 are issues that confront my children a century later. Um, and these are issues such as uh, the concept of statehood of modern Arab countries and nations, um, issues of identity, of personal identity, of collective identity, of national identity, issues of citizenship rights, what are the rights of individual citizens in most of these countries, the rule of law, the equal application of justice, uh, issues of development and, and meeting basic human needs in many countries in the Middle East are still priority issues that have not been uh, very f fully or very uh, well met. The issue of the relationship between Zionism, the Jewish national movement, and Arabism, the Arab national identity movement. The relationship between the Palestinian state or Palestinian, the rights of the Palestinian Arab community and the rights of uh, Jews and, uh, and the state of Israel today. The relationships between them uh, are issues that have still not been resolved uh, after virtually a century, uh, just over a century of, uh, of tensions between them. Um, the issue of the relationship between the Arab people and Arab countries and the great Western power or the big Western powers, in the past it was Britain and, and France, the colonial powers, today it's more the United States. What is our relationship? Are we friends or are we enemies? Uh, why do these armies keep coming at us from the West uh, decade after decade? Are these armies that we should welcome or that we should fear? Um, the, the fundamental relationship between the Arab world and the Western powers is one that has not been resolved or identified clearly in the last century. Uh, the, re, the interplay or the balance between religiosity and secularism is one of the great issues of the last century that still challenges and plagues uh, and taunts uh, many people in the, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and we have both religious dimensions of our public life and private life, and we have secular dimensions. And this is an issue that remains uh, unresolved. Um, and finally, the issue of fundamental stability and security and prosperity. Uh, most of the countries of the Middle East are, uh, are facing problems of internal tensions, stresses, uh, sometimes revolts, sometimes active civil wars, uh, border conflicts. Um, th these, the basic issues of a stable society where people can go to work and go to school and invest their money and, and become more prosperous uh, remain unresolved in, uh, in most parts of the Middle East. So it's really quite, it's stunning that my children should be addressing the same issues as my grandparents. Uh, but it is a reality of the Arab world, and it is one of the reasons why the Arab world is such a uh, um, violent region or unstable region or uh, tumultuous region. Um, and what we've seen in the second part of the last century, uh, since the 1950s or so, is a region that has been relatively frozen in terms of the impact of the Cold War, the impact of the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, the impact of centralized power closely wielded by small groups of people in most of the, uh, of the Arab countries, um, autocratic regimes without any real uh, democratic uh, principles. Uh, and finally, the impact of the oil-fueled years after the mid-1970s when the price of oil went up and there was a lot of money in many parts of the Arab world which was used to fuel uh, basic uh, development and infrastructure building. Uh, and this acted as a kind of a, a break. It kept the whole system with these other issues, the Cold War and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, the, the region didn't change very much in the second part um, of the 20th century. 
In, starting in the 1990s or so, early 1990s, you started to get some movement with the, with the end of the Cold War. Uh, you started, and with the oil boom starting to uh, taper off uh, a little bit, and with internal problems that people were suffering in various Arab countries, you started to get some uh, liberalization uh, taking place, and the, and the end of the Cold War particularly was an important uh, cause of this. And the region started to evolve. You had elections here, and you had parliamentary uh, group, par uh, political parties there, more free press. There started to be some evolution and movement in the political system. And then uh, you had 9-11. Uh, 9-11 uh, was, uh, was a defining moment uh, for the United States, uh, clearly, and remains a defining moment. Uh, in terms of the Middle East, it was a more complex uh, uh, had more, the impact was much more uh, complex. But what you've had since 9-11 has been a series of developments that we can identify, uh, and their impact on the Middle East has been substantial. The, the most important one um, has been the actual physical military movement of large numbers of American troops into the Middle East um, with the... Uh, um, invasion of Iraq and the changing of the regime in Iraq, uh, first with Afghanistan and, uh, and then in Iraq. And not only the movement of troops from the United States, but the explicit active American policy of preemptive warfare, changing regimes, redrawing the map of the region, uh, draining the swamp, uh, as it's called. Uh, these are now official American policies and uh, their impact has been quite significant, as I'll, I'll mention. We've also had in recent years the, uh, the more clear impact of the, um, the years of failed Arab-Israeli peacemaking. And this is an important issue that I want to stress because the Arab-Israeli issue is localized to some extent in terms of Palestine and Israel, Lebanon, Syria, and Israel. Jordan and Egypt have signed their peace agreements, but you still have these uh, active, uh, unresolved conflicts focusing around Israel and its immediate neighbors, but the impact of that goes much beyond those areas and touches on uh, many, many uh, parts of the Middle East in terms of public attitudes and public perceptions. But the, the most important thing I want to say about the Arab-Israeli conflict right now is that after almost a century of tensions, and I say century because you can say modern Zionism started in around 1896 when you first had the idea of a Jewish state, when people in Europe, Theodor Herzl and others were saying, let's have the Jewish people resolve the problems that they've had in Europe and the pogroms and the discrimination. And before uh, the Nazis, before the Holocaust, you had uh, some people, in, Jews in Europe, saying, let's have a Jewish state. Uh, in Palestine, and that's where the Jews can live in peace and, and security and not have to put up with the uh, discrimination and the killing and the pogroms that they suffered in Europe and Russia. Um, and so 1896, you could say, is the beginning of the uh, tension, say, between uh, uh, Zionists and, uh, and Arab nationalism. Uh, and after a century of, un of being unable to resolve that conflict, um, what you've had is a, a shift, I would say, among Israelis and Palestinians into a mode in which they are engaged in all-out existential warfare. Uh, and what I mean by that is that in the last uh, um, uh, four or five years, we've seen very clearly the kind of violent, almost uh, barbaric uh, activities uh, by both sides. Uh, killing each other with a severity and a ferocity uh, that is really unprecedented. Um, you have Israelis firing missiles from F-16s into urban neighborhoods in Gaza. Um, they say because they want to kill terrorists or militant leaders, but they end up also killing uh, children and uh, innocent uh, men and women. And you have on the other side Palestinians setting off bombs in pizza parlors in Tel Aviv uh, they say because they want to resist the uh, Israeli occupation, but they're also killing innocent civilians or s children sitting around eating uh, pizza. This kind of barbarism, this kind of ferocity, uh, 
um, is, is new in the Arab-Israeli conflict. This didn't uh, 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 define the, the uh, tensions between them in past years, but it's new because both sides feel uh, a kind of existential frenzy or a fear, and both sides feel that this is a battle that's going to be won in a zero-sum a, a way that whoever wins is going to wipe out the other side completely. We have many Israelis who fear that Israel is in danger of being wiped out, that there will be no more uh, Israel. Uh, and you have Palestinians who feel the same thing, that Palestine, that the Jews, that the Israelis want to the Palestinian as a political entity, that there should be no more Palestinian consciousness, no more Palestinian state. The Palestinians can live wherever they want as individuals, but they don't have a collective identity. This kind of existential fear on both sides has uh, pushed them into what I call living in biblical time. Uh, biblical time meaning that they don't sit there and talk t about who's going to win this battle or who's going to gain this piece of territory. They're talking about who's going to be here ten generations from now. Who's going to survive uh, this war between us and who's going to be wiped out. And one of the markers of that I think which is I think quite interesting, I'm not so sure what its full significance is, is that last year marked the year in which the Palestinian exile that started in 1948 became one year longer than the ancient uh, Jewish exile in Babylon, which lasted from 587 to 533, depending on how you take the historicity of the Bible. Uh, but it was around 54 years uh, of exile or so. The Palestinians have been now in exile for 55 years and are, are are counting. Um, this has a psychological significance, perhaps, which we can see in the behavior of the Palestinians. In the intif they've had two intifadas now, and you've had the Israelis responding with the same kind of ferocity, um, expanding settlements, building the wall, uh, assassinating uh, people, uh, and basically the, Israel disregarding the whole question of international law, the world court, they, the UN resolutions. They say we don't care about that. We want to protect the Jewish people, the Israeli people, we will do whatever we want, whatever we need to do to protect Israel and the Jewish people, and the Palestinians in return are saying we will do whatever we have to do to make sure that the Palestinians continue to live and enjoy their rights to live in a state. But this ferocity, uh, this living in biblical time, uh, has had a profound impact on most of the region, and the American connection with that is something that it has become extremely significant because one of the main reasons why people throughout the Middle East and the entire world criticize the United States government is because of, it is perce because of its perceived uh, partiality for Israel rather than being even-handed in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, and this is critically important to the point where you get people like Tony Blair in England or Pervez Musharraf in uh, Pakistan publicly pleading with the American president saying, please help the American, let the United States help the Israelis and Palestinians solve their conflict through peaceful negotiations. Uh, so the impact of this is critically important and particularly the, the, American, uh, the American connection with it. We've had another important trend in recent years which is the impact of a large population of young people throughout the Arab world which is um, increasingly in difficult situation in terms of being um, unemployed, um, not uh, finding sufficient work opportunities, frustrated politically in terms of living in societies that are autocratic and uh, without uh, sufficient democratic uh, uh, freedoms. Uh, you have frustrations of young people, and you're talking of young people under the age of 30 who probably make up somewhere around 50 percent of the entire populations. These are huge numbers of people, probably 100, 130 million people in the Arab countries who are young, most of them, or many of them educated, and all of them very frustrated uh, for various reasons, whether frustrated by their own internal autocracy, lack of job opportunities, uh, Arab-Israeli issues, the presence of foreign armies, the whole range of issues that bears down on them. And these are the young people who provide the foot soldiers for the uh, terrorists, for the extremist movements, for the radical movements. Um, and this is a factor that, again, has only really become more clear in the last 10 or 15 years or so. This large, young, uh, troubled, uh, and uh, troublesome uh, population. 
Um, and when you look at these factors together and you look at the Arab world, what you see are really three different groups in society. You can take all of society and you can differentiate it into three different groups. You have at the top a small group which I call the palace, the, the regimes, the elite, um, the presidents, the kings, the prime ministers, the people who run the power structures of society, people who are in almost all cases not elected, not accountable in any kind of democratic process, in some cases put in power by the former colonial regimes, but a power elite that rules at the very top, which in recent years has become much more uh, keen to be close friends with the United States because the United States gives them money, gives them guns, gives them protection. Um, and now the elite, the palace, is much closer to the United States because of the United States waging the war on terror and they need the active cooperation of Arab governments and security services, intelligence services, and police to wage the uh, war on terror. In the middle of the society, you have the vast majority of ordinary middle class people uh, who I would call the street, meaning the vast majority of ordinary middle class people uh, who are not part of the power structure, but neither are they terrorists or bombers. Um, the, the people who are trying to get on with their lives and to educate their kids and to have decent jobs. And at the bottom, at the bottom level, you have small numbers of, very small numbers of people who have left that middle class, that, that street, the Arab street, and have gone down into the basement, what I call the basement, and started making bombs, and started throwing bombs and, and becoming uh, agents of terrorism. The Osama bin Ladens and the Abu Musab al-Zarqawis and the uh, people of this kind and others like them who have given up on trying to bring about a peaceful change in their societies, whether it's Arab-Israeli uh, peace or democracy in their own countries or human development or good relations with the West, whatever issue concerns them, they've basically given up. They've gone down into the basement in their uh, uh, cities and there or some of them are in New Jersey, some of them are in Hamburg, Germany, some of them are in Madrid, Spain and, and they're in Riyadh and Amman and Nablus and Beirut. They're all over the place in Karachi, wherever you want. There's basements where people are making and using bombs. Uh, the problematic thing is that this small group of people in the palace which is trying to be very close to the United States is countered by this very small group of people in the basement that's making bombs and trying to bomb the United States or more recently capture Americans and cut their heads off and put the tapes on the internet in Iraq or other places or Saudi Arabia. But the, the most troubling thing is that this huge middle segment, the middle, uh, the middle class, the, the, the public opinion in the Arab world is watching all of this stuff on television. And they're watching all this stuff uh, and what's most troubling to me is that the middle, the vast middle classes of the Arab world and the Middle East are not actively condemning the terrorism acts uh, of people like bin Laden and Zarqawi and in many cases may even be quietly not cheering them on but certainly understanding what these people are doing in this attack against the United States and this defiance of the Arab regimes uh, in attacking the Saudi regime and attacking foreigners in Saudi Arabia and doing the kinds of uh, deeds that the terror groups are doing, the vast majority of people in the Arab world are, f because of the frustrations I mentioned of the economic stress, the problems of relations with Israel, the problems of relations with the Western armies that keep coming at us every few decades, there has been this degradation of the fundamental moral values uh, and sort of decency of vast uh, groups of people in the Arab world who now watch television to see whose head did we cut off today, not we, but whose head did people in the Arab world cut off today. And this is the context in which the United States has gone into Iraq. This very troubling regional environment that I've uh, sketched for you um, Obviously, there's elements of it that are good. I've, I've focused on the problematic points. Uh, you have, at the same time, 
some good things are going on. People are going to school, uh, hospitals are being built, uh, health care is improving. Um, but the negative issues are the more striking ones and the more troubling ones. And if we look at the uh, post-9-11 trend and the environment since 9-11, the great uh, shock that the United States suffered, the trauma of this attack of 9-11, and what the United States government has done in the three years or so since then, uh, I think we see some extremely mixed and I would say mostly troubling results and consequences. Um, and this is the main point that I would like to make tonight, which is to suggest that there is an urgency now in the United States, uh, as well as in the Middle East, but more in the United States, to re-examine not only the policies that the United States has been pursuing since 9-11, but the basic analytical framework the basic assumptions, uh, the basic diagnoses that have been made by this country of what is wrong over there, of why there is a swamp over there, of how this swamp was created, and who are the people who live in this swamp, and why did they attack us, or why did a few of them uh, attack us here in the United States. The fundamental diagnosis uh, of the whole 9-11 phenomenon and afterwards, I think needs serious re-examination um, uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, but the, the mixed results um, are m mainly because the war on terror, I think, has become a problem for the United States and now for the entire world uh, because it has become an instrument of fighting terrorism on the one hand and probably promoting other forms of terrorism on the other hand. I know that's a pretty uh, harsh statement to make, but I think this is what the modern, re the reality of the last three years uh, suggests, certainly as seen uh, from the Middle East. The mixed results we see uh, coming from the American policy in Iraq and in the wider Middle East and in the war on terror after 9-11 um, can be seen most clearly in the Middle East because the Middle East is in fact the crucible and the testing ground for the new American policies that have been articulated and now implemented by the Bush administration with the uh, ideological driving force of the uh, neoconservatives, the neocons uh, in Washington. Policies of regime change, of preemptive warfare, uh, of forcing people to reform and change their ways um, of fighting the war on terror uh, and of the draining the swamp uh, syndrome. Uh, I think if you look around the region, uh, the Middle East, and you look around the whole world, it becomes pretty clear that there have been uh, some successes in terms of capturing terrorists, breaking up training grounds, stopping financial flows. There's no doubt that there have been some successes in some areas, uh, but what we also see is that the phenomenon of terrorism has been diffusing around the world in a much more clear and perhaps even uh, rapid manner that the incidents of terrorism uh, since 9-11 uh, have become much more uh, diverse and widespread, including in Madrid and, and in Istanbul and in Indonesia and Australia and Saudi Arabia and Morocco. Uh, there's been a much bigger problem with terrorism around the world, I think, since 9-11 than there was before 9-11. Now, what is the exact relationship between this phenomenon of expanding terror and the American policy after 9-11? It's very difficult to tell. It's very hard to tell, and we need obviously historians and social scientists to figure that out for us. And, and the future will, uh, will explain this better, but my uh, hunch and my uh, initial uh, sense, and I think many people in the region and the world share this, is that the manner in which the United States has almost unilaterally gone to, to engage the world and to wage the war on terror uh, has made terror a much more uh, widespread problem in many cases and has made it much more difficult to control because obviously the terror groups uh, have diffused into much smaller uh, groups all over the world. Um, 
And if we look at uh, Iraq in particular, the real dilemma for the United States in Iraq uh, is that the war in Iraq, which was initially it was uh, said to be because of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and Iraq was posing a threat to the United States, um, later we were told that this was to fight the uh, war on terror and to spread democracy in the Middle East. Whatever the real reasons w were or are, the reality is that the American presence in Iraq has been a significant uh, magnet that has attracted people into terror networks uh, both to fight the United States and, and also to fight uh, Iraqis and possibly uh, people in Arab countries. If you go back and you remember the initial reasons that Osama bin Laden gave for uh, when he first started uh, attacking the U.S. in the early 90s or attacking American targets, it was the military presence of the United States in Saudi Arabia. That was his most important complaint against the United States back in the early 90s. The American military presence that stayed in Saudi Arabia after the uh, first Gulf War. Uh, having a huge American military presence in Iraq now is acting in the same way. It is acting as, a, uh, as an impetus for people who are critical of the United States, uh, whether in political terms or people who want to engage in military acts and terrorism. Uh, it is, the American presence in Iraq is, is inducing a lot of people to become much more anti-American and even to fight against the United States. Uh, another problem we've had since the war in Iraq and the American um, unilateral policies around the world has been a huge increase in criticism of the United States all around the world. Um, and we're not talking now about people in the Arab world or Muslims or Arabs or people in that area, people in the swamp. It's not just the swamp that's criticizing the United States. It's the Belgians and the Chinese and the Brazilians and it's everybody around the world basically that has now become much more critical of American policy. And I would even go so far as to say that in terms of the global sentiments uh, that it is the United States that is perceived by the vast majority of people in the world to be a rogue state and not some of these other little countries that the U.S. is primarily accusing of being rogue states. It is the United States that is fundamentally acting outside of the moral and political and legal consensus that is very clearly defined on a global basis by the institutions of uh, multilateral uh, agreements, uh, the United Nations Charter, UN resolutions, international conventions, however you want to define that global consensus, uh, the United States is more often than not the party that is seen to be outside that consensus and therefore is a, the United States is more and more criticized by countries around the world and not just criticized but I think also feared and being resisted politically. Um, and what we've had in the last say four, five, six years is a very troubling movement from episodic occasional acts of terror against American targets by very, very small numbers of terrorists here and there, that has moved now into a much more globalized cycle of terror and anti-terror, of people attacking the U.S. and the U.S. attacking them back with military means. Uh, equally troubling for me is that I don't think we have any more idea today than we did three years ago in 9-11 we don't have any real clear idea today of why the United States was attacked. This is one of the most extraordinary aspects of what's gone on in the last three years, is that despite the enormous trauma that the United States suffered, despite the enormous criminality of the acts that were committed against the United States, despite the overwhelming global consensus that existed in, in the days after 9-11 to work with the United States to lead an, a global uh, campaign against terror, despite all of these very positive elements, uh, the United States decided to embark on a course that was predominantly un unilateral and heavily militaristic um, without in any significant way either correctly diagnosing the underlying causes of terrorism or accurately defining the reasons why the United States was attacked. 
It's one of the most perplexing episodes of American foreign policy incoherence and militarism combined in a very gruesome cycle of revenge attacks and preemptive attacks and military uh, regime change uh, initiatives uh, without, even, without achieving any of the fundamental initial targets of this policy, which is to stop terrorism, but in fact has even probably made terrorism much worse today and much more difficult to fight today than it was three years ago and has isolated the United States in a very significant way around the world. It's one of the most perplexing episodes of, I think, wrong decision-making, bad analysis, misguided prognosis, counterproductive policies, and uh, inappropriate implementation of American foreign policies. One of the most uh, striking, uh, I think, uh, misguided failures of American policy, certainly in, uh, in my lifetime. Um, and it's peculiarly un-American. The United States doesn't normally do this. Uh, what the United States does in its domestic policies and usually in its foreign policies, if there's a problem, the United States tends to attack it uh, with an engineer's mentality, to look at the symptoms, understand them accurately, diagnose the underlying causes of the problem, come up with an appropriate uh, antidote or a solution or a strategy, implement that strategy methodically. If it doesn't work, change it, adapt it until you solve the problem. We haven't had any of that really being done with the uh, threat that the United States faced uh, with the terror of 9-11 uh, and the subsequent challenges uh, that it has faced. There has been a peculiar lack of a serious debate within the United States uh, about the real issue of terrorism and about the issue of terrorism against the United States. Because there's also the problem of terrorism against the Saudi regime and the Moroccan regime and the Jordanian regime and, uh, and uh, different uh, countries around the Middle East. So the U.S. is not the only target of terror uh, in the world. Uh, but I think the, the real uh, dilemma has been uh, that the United States misdiagnosed the problem and came up with a strategy that has made the problem worse. And going into Iraq now has compounded the, uh, the uh, challenges and the threats uh, that the United States has to the point now where it's almost become routine to turn on your TV and, and see a, a story or an image of an American or a foreigner who, was, who just had their head cut off. Um, and we have this gruesome cycle now with Donald Rumsfeld on one side and Abu Musab al-Zarqawi on the other side or Osama bin Laden uh, doing battle every night on um, MSNBC and Fox and CNN and then Jazeera in Arabic. And most of the people in this country and in the Arab world are watching this stuff on television. It's, it's, it's one of the most uh, frightening uh, phenomena of my adult lifetime to watch not only the cycle of violence and, and, and terror and counter uh, uh, warfare against terror happening, but to watch this acquiescence in the public, uh, in, the, um, in the United States and in the Arab world, to watch these gen public, uh, the, pu the public opinion and the people in these societies f seemingly unable to do anything about this, uh, and just watching it on TV and, and you know, when our guys hit their guys, you say, well, you know, they deserve it, we feel good, and then on the other side says exactly the same thing. And I think that we need a wake-up call, both in the United States and in the Arab world, about how to get out of the cycle. Uh, this is not a comfortable cycle uh, to be in, and if you go back over just the last two years or so, it is rapidly getting uh, much, much worse. And there's many reasons for why the United States has pursued this policy, and I, I don't have time to get into them now, but um, whatever the reasons are, they need to be subjected to a much more serious uh, public debate in this country. And at the same time, I would say, we in the Middle East need to be engaged in a much more uh, open and honest uh, debate about our relationships um, with each other uh, in the Middle East in terms of our own problems that created the conditions in the Middle East from which terrorism emerged. We are not uh, 
uh, innocent uh, bystanders. And I am not by any means saying that all the problems are the fault of the United States or of Israel. I'm saying that the Arab countries, the leaderships, the societies, Israel and the United States, these three principal parties share, sh jointly must share the responsibility for this terrible situation uh, that we're in. And we must somehow start the process of looking at our own societies, at least taking responsibility for what we do in our societies and you here in the United States to at least spark a public discussion uh, about these issues. It's difficult in the United States, I know, uh, to question the uh, whole uh, foreign policy of, uh, of the Bush administration. It was very difficult right after 9-11, of course, because of the, of the trauma and the shock that happened then. Uh, but at some point, I think honest people need to stand up and tell the American leadership and tell the Arab leadership and tell the Israeli leadership that their policies are driving us into this cycle of violence and beheadings and killings and bombing urban neighborhoods, which is only going to make this much, much worse in the future. And it's only a matter of time until some of these people in the basements are going to find chemical weapons and biological weapons, and they're going to come and they're going to kill 20,000 Americans at one time, not just uh, 3,000. And it's only a matter of time until somebody says, look, let's go nuke them. And nuke them means drop a nuclear weapon on one of these cities in the Middle East uh, to teach them a lesson. We obviously want to avoid getting uh, to that point. But if you go back over the last three years especially, that trend is clearly uh, becoming more menacing and more of a possibility. Um, I'll end by saying that there is a uh, sense in the United States that the world changed after 9-11. Um, I would suggest that that is a peculiarly American perception, which is certainly true for the United States. Uh, I think the America's perception of the world did change on 9-11. Um, but not much change for the rest of the world. Um, not much change for the rest of the world. Um, having American troops go to Iraq and overthrow a regime and, and uh, say that the U.S. wants to um, bring democracy to the Middle East and ch change our values and reform our education systems and redraw our map. And this is all of these sort of things that American officials have said. This is nothing new to us, unfortunately. We've lived with this problem of Western armies coming at us uh, for years and years and years. This is the second time in a century that you have the British army in southern Iraq trying to fix things up in southern Iraq. And what in the world is the British Army doing twice in the same century in the same country? If they screwed it up the first time, what are they doing coming back to try to do it again? But this is the reality that we've lived with. And it's not just the 20th century. We're, we remember Napoleon. We remember the Crusaders. And I even remember Alexander the Great in the middle of the 4th century BC. And this is a long historical problem. This is a long historical problem that has not only plagued the people of the Middle East, but I think has traumatized us. Um, and the trauma that you have felt uh, in, during and after 9-11 um, is, is very special to you, uh, special in a, in a, in a terrible way. Um, it's very, it left a profound impact on you because I would argue that 9-11 marked the beginning of the entry of modern America into modern world history. It was the first collective traumatic experience that you experienced as Americans all together. Never before in modern history has the, have the people of the United States collectively suffered a traumatic experience such as 9-11. Pearl Harbor wasn't it, Vietnam wasn't it, the Civil War wasn't it, but this was an experience that everybody shared, reacted to similarly, uh, and it, it was a great moment of uh, Americans feeling in their moment of trauma and, and, and suffering and, uh, and being deeply wounded as they were. Uh, it also marked a, a turning point, I think, in some kind of sense of nationalist uh, feeling and national identity in the United States. 
if, if, if you feel, if you understand how important that is to you, imagine how, imp how those kinds of sentiments impact on people in the Middle East when they've gone through this century after century after century for about two and a half millennia. Um, so 9-11 was no big deal. I shouldn't say, uh, I take those words back. I don't mean no big deal. 9-11 was not a, a defining historical moment for the rest of the world as it was for the United States. 9-11 uh, was a moment of great criminal activity by a small number of people who attacked the United States, uh, but it was, uh, by the rest of the world, uh, it was seen to be another terrible example of terrorism which happened to have taken place uh, in the United States. And uh, the challenge that faces us all in the United States, in the Arab world, is how do we draw on these collective experiences? I outlined for you at the beginning the problems that uh, define much of the modern Arab world and the Middle East, um, economic problems, social issues, uh, unresolved uh, centuries-long uh, challenges, um, frustrations, uh, political humiliation, occupation, foreign armies, autocratic regimes, uh, this whole range of issues collectively uh, traumatizing many of our people. Um, and you have yourself still this problem of 9-11 and what happened and why did they do it and who are these people and what do they want and how can we stop this from happening in the future. Our, our mutual challenge, I think, is not to allow these problems to send us into the cycle of, uh, of uh, bin Ladenist and Rumsfeldian revenge and counter-revenge and attack and counter-attack. Uh, that is a terrible cycle to get into. I think our challenge is rather to draw on the strongest traditions of the United States and of the Arab and Islamic world, uh, the very powerful traditions of, of justice, uh, of humility, uh, of reconciliation, uh, of forgiveness, but most of all, of justice and dignity, uh, of lives built on uh, the consent of the governed, uh, the rule of law, uh, habeas corpus, uh, protection of minority rights, the affirmation of majority rule, the most fundamental principles that define the modern United States, but that also define the best aspects of Arab and Islamic culture. And you will, follow, those of you who know the Middle East or who come to the Middle East, you will see these values practiced in the family at the local community level, uh, in the best traditions of the religious institutions. Um, how do we reach into our respective societies and bring these uh, powerful values uh, up and mobilize the, those vast people, uh, those vast middle classes that are watching the terrorists and the anti-terrorist warriors, watching them on TV? How do we get those vast numbers of people in the middle classes and societies of our respective countries to work together uh, to demand, first of all, better policies from our leaders, more intelligent uh, policies, more uh, effective policies, and more uh, humane, and I would even say more legal policies, legal in terms of respecting the norms of international law uh, and even the laws of our own countries. So I think this is a moment of great potential change in the Middle East, but it needs also great reassessment, great introspection, to be more honest, uh, to speak out, uh, and to stand up uh, in this country, in the Arab countries, in Israel, wherever it's appropriate. And if the emperor is wearing no clothes, to tell the emperor that he's wearing no clothes. To say that the policies that are being practiced are leading us into much, much more difficult and violent waters. Uh, and that we don't want to go uh, to those places anymore. That we want to break the cycle of violence and revenge and anger and hatred and to replace it with something better. Thank you very much.